misuse is something that I did want to bring up because sometimes you have maybe a pain prescription and it might say take one tablet every six hours is needed for pain. And you're finding that to treat your pain, you gotta attack it more frequently than every six hours. Maybe you're using that drug every four hours for the first couple of days. Or maybe you're having to take two pills. And so you're really not abiding by the way that drug was prescribed for you. And so that, that's more of a misuse situation. It can become a problem of abuse, but it's something that you know you shouldn't slap yourself around if you're having to take a little bit more just to treat the pain because you are still using it for that medical condition. Um, tolerance is something we've heard about. That's gradually requiring an increased dose in order to have the same effect that you had previously. And addiction is a primary chronic neurobiological disease. It does have genetic and social and environmental factors. And sometimes it's, um, it, it involves compulsive use. It involves craving. And the key here is that someone will continue to use the drug despite the fact that it's causing them <coughs> harm and that it has negative social impacts. You know, they may have lost their job, they may have lost their family, and they're still not able to let go of that drug, and that's a true, a true addiction situation. Um, opiates, we've tended to kind of um, morph these two together. We, we, just, we just call them narcotics, but the FDA um, definition of a narcotic does include things like cocaine. So it's not just an opiate, even though it originated that way. Um, and opiate itself are these drugs that are related to opium and its derivatives. Uh, and these are some of the names of the drugs that you're probably familiar with out there. The morphine, codeine, hydrocodone, which is the war tab of vitamin, the loud and fentanyl has been a relatively new one on the abuse market. It's been used as um, in surgical situations, um, but it has sort of drifted onto the street, unfortunately. Methadone and then oxymorphone is a fairly new one called the Panna. So prescription drug abuse is not new. Um, it's, it's been sort of historic that people will tend to um, overuse drugs and then abuse them. Uh, barbiturates was something that was big. You had your Nembutal, your Psychonol, um, they called them yellows and reds, and they were originally prescribed for sleep um, and often implicated in overdose situations. Others were chloral hydrate, Tolman, Darvon. Um, in the 60s, along comes benzodiazepines, Librium and Valium came on the scene and were kind of touted to be a more safe sleep medi medication, also used for anxiety. And um, they kind of replaced the barbiturates as a sleep aid. Stimulants that have been abused are our college drugs here, Adderall and Ritalin. I mean, they're really intended to be used um, for attention deficit disorder uh, because they really increase focus. Well, it, you know, who needs more focus than that last minute study session in in college, and so these drugs have drifted into that arena and have been abused as well because of the stimulation that it provides. And I found, uh, as you've probably seen, you pick up a newspaper, you pick up a magazine, and there's something in there that involves this situation with drug misuse and abuse. And I was, uh, I was somewhere, picked up a magazine, and it, there was an article about Judy Garland written by her son, and there you have it. She overdosed on barbiturates, and, and that, you know, that was her cause of death. And then I was thinking, well, Marilyn Monroe, same thing. You know, I started reading on that, and she kind of had a cocktail going on with um, the chloral hydrate and barbiturates also. Um, Elvis Presley was another. Um, situation. Michael Jackson and more recently Prince. These were all prescription drug overdose situations. I've gotten 
out of hand with these people. I mean, that's just, you know, very, uh, the big celebrities, but it, it happens. There's, I could name tons more probably on those, those lists that went by in the Academy Awards as far as the in memoriam thing. We lost a lot of people to this situation. Non-prescription abusables. Um, these are the drugs, you know, that have been abused for a long period of time and, and weren't really started by the, um, you know, as the prescription drugs. And other addictions that we have. There's gambling addictions, there's food addictions, shopping addictions. Uh, I just, uh, I think it was a TED talk that I saw on the social media. You know, we're, we're attached to those phones that we have now. And some of the social media platforms like Facebook, it was interesting. They found now that people, you know, you, you post something and you're immediately drawn back to see, well, did they get any likes? Is anybody sharing this? And they've seen that the dopamine levels in the brain, the very addictive things that we see with these other drugs, are being triggered by that social media, you know, checking your phone to see, you know, if somebody's liked what you said. So, you know, we are prone to these addictive qualities, I think. Um, but one of the things that all of these things have in common is that they release the chemical dopamine, and the dopamine is really kind of a feel-good drug. It will travel to your central nervous system, and it will cause um, kind of a euphoric uh, feeling a feeling that you know other things don't really matter, life is good, and that's a positive reinforcement. So you have something that gives you that feeling, you felt good about it, you want to do that again, and that's part of the addiction cycle. Here we go. <laughs> you can't be have a pharmacy talk about some type of a, a science slide. I'll just quickly go through this. You can see there there's the, the neurotransmitters being released going across little synapse there and hitting that other nerve cell. And that's what's happening. We've got, when we have the opiates, they're landing on a receptor site. And that is, um, it's a receptor that decreases the pain impulse going to the brain. So as it's landing on that, the pain subsides somewhat. And what it also does is it leads to some other chemical reactions that also release some dopamine. So you've kind of got a two-fold thing going on there. Makes you feel good, you want to do it again. So why are we talking about this? Excuse me. Um, well, it's become a huge public health issue. Um, in 2015, 10.3 million people were using prescription opioids non-medically. They weren't using it for pain anymore, they were using it basically to get high. Emergency department visits involving the misuse or abuse of prescription opioids increased 153% between 2004 and 2011. That's huge, we're talking, you know, seven years. The rate of fatal prescription opiate overdoses nearly quadrupled from 2000 to 2014. So going from 1.5 to 5.9 deaths per 100,000 tragic. So we can see some of these. I'm going to try to get through some of these graphs quickly, but I found them very interesting. This is opiate consumption um, in milli, milli equivalents or equivalents on milligrams per person. And so to describe that, there are so many different drugs. You can, there are a bunch of different apples, oranges, bananas in this mix. You can't really um, equate one with the other in terms of their strength. So what they do is they'll turn them into like a morphine equivalent dose, and so then you can look at the whole statistical information and, and have a more um, meaningful outcome. So what they've done is they've looked at the milligrams per person. And you can see it's gradually been climbing. It decided kind of with a flat line there from 1980 until it looks like about 86. So let's see what happened. This was a study that came out, and there were several studies going on, but this one actually said that it was concluded that opiate 
maintenance therapy can be a safe salutary, I thought, what the heck does that mean? But I couldn't take it out because it was a quote. But it means beneficial or productive. So it was a beneficial, more humane alternative to the options of surgery or no treatment in those patients with intractable, non-malignant pain and no history of drug abuse. So it sounded like they were pretty safe. This is what happens in 1986. And you can see, we start getting a little blip on the scale there. So then we have the California Intractable Pain Treatment Act. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, and it came out and said that no physician shall be subject to disciplinary action for prescribing controlled substances for pain or a condition causing pain. We sort of had this pendulum you know, going back and forth. We had physicians who were reluctant to prescribe opiates because they were under such scrutiny. We have the triplicate system here. So whenever they wrote a Schedule II drug, which included our opiate class, one of those copies went to the DEA. And so then a bunch of those came in, all of a sudden the DEA is at their door and wanting to go through their prescriptions and see what happens. So consequently, there was a reduction in treatment of pain with opiates. And people were complaining and complaining loudly. You know, their pain was really not adequately being treated. And so we tried to reverse that to some extent and went overboard, as we'll see. But this kind of came to alleviate the physician's fear that he, there was going to be repercussions if he was treating people's pain with opiates. Um, it said that they needed to have a prior exam and medical indication for prescribing controlled substances. Well, that seems like that would be a, a natural. And it excluded um, patients that were being treated for substance use. So it was basically that if a patient has pain, a uh, physician's not going to be under disciplinary action for treating it. So that was in 1990, and we see the gradual <coughs> uplifting of that line again. Ta-da, here we come, 1995, OxyContin gets its FDA approval. <coughs> it was very aggressively marketed as a real wonder drug for chronic pain. And it was marketed as a first-line therapy for chronic pain. And we'll see as we go through this, there are some other ways to, to approach your pain management, not starting with OxyContin um, being a, a, the bottom line. But, it was aggressively marketed. They did have some um, fines and uh, repercussions from their over-marketing approach. And in, in response, in 2010, they did come up with a tamper-resistant formulation of that. But we saw, a, we'll see some um, evidence here, we saw a lot of repercussions from this because OxyContin and MS-Cotton, which is morphine long-acting, um, while they are good for treating a chronic, you know, giving you a baseline kind of low level management of that pain to make it tolerable, it's very slow, it's slow acting and long acting. And this is one of my side stories. Um, one of the problems that we were seeing were that people who were using these for non-medical reasons found that you can crush them and suddenly you have a burst of medication but people who were taking them for treating pain got, were able to get into trouble because it was so slow acting. So they take it and eh, nothing's really happening yet. So they must need another, another tablet. They must need a, a larger dose. So they might take a second one. Well, along the first one starts hitting and the next thing you know, the second one comes on and that's just too much drug for that individual. So, you know, you could get into trouble with those long-acting drugs because they really don't act that quickly. And about close to that same time, 1996, pain is the fifth vital sign came along. This really kind of turned the medical community upside down as far as its treatment of pain because um, you, you had to ask about somebody's pain 
if they were in for pneumonia or for an abscess or something, you know, that would typically not cause me abscess isn't a great um, you know example because that can be painful, but you know, something that was totally unrelated to something that could cause pain, you were still required to to investigate that pain. And that pain scale came out too, one to ten. You know, you have a happy face, you have a crying face. You know, where are you in this line? And you know, this this constant thing. The goal was to treat people's pain, which was admirable. But what happened was it became you know people started feeling that they should be at zero. You know, you've got that zero to ten. Well, I'm not going to be happy at three or four. You know, I want to be at zero. It says right here I can be a happy face at zero. So it, it was a dilemma for the medical community to try to get people satisfied with their pain control. Um, they said the opiate should have a role in chronic pain treatment. And they also said that um, if, if you use opiates for pain, then your development of addiction is very low. And so people kind of had the false notion that it was really safe. And it was treating their pain, so they could use more, but not risk that addiction developing. Turned out to not be so true. This joint commission, for those of you who aren't in the healthcare profession, that is a body, a regulatory body that would come to the hospitals. And in order to be paid for Medicare and Medi-Cal patients, you had to pass their inspections. And one of the things they started dwelling on was, well, how well are you managing pain in your facility? And you wanted those patients to say, hey, I, uh, they're doing a great job. Well, they're not gonna say you're doing a great job if they're still in pain. And so it became a motivation to really start using all these drugs, you know, probably more than perhaps they should have been in order to get that pain level to a satisfactory um, condition patient's mind. So we can see what happens with our little curve here. We have Oxycontin and we have people inspecting you to make sure people are pain free. And so we have a whopping of rise in this whole um, consumption of opiates. Well, as we would suspect, we also have a huge increase in opiate sales. So you have that um, you have that top line, that sales in kilograms, which is 2.2 pounds, per 10,000 people. And we see then also the increase that we have in treatment admissions to emergency departments. And we see on our top, we see the top line, which is the sales, and we also see the deaths going up proportionately. This I thought was interesting. This is this shows us the source of prescription painkillers. And this is over a period of a year. They, um, they interviewed all these people. And during the past year, they were asked to um, relay during the different time frames where they were getting their, um, their pain medications. So you can see, in the beginning, days one through 29, they have a lot of helpful friends and relatives. You know, yeah, I have some left over from my prescription that I probably got 100 pills and I only needed, you know, 15 of them, but so I have some. Here you go. And so you see, as we go through time, that we've got 30 days to 99 days. Well, they're not quite so willing to give you so many. And that number keeps dropping down as far as the friends or relatives throughout time. What we also see is people getting prescriptions from one or more physicians, that's that red line, and that's starting to go up. And then we become a little less honest and we're, um, we're stealing, but we're not, we're not bad thieves, it doesn't look like. And then bought, oh here we, we're willing to pay our friends and relatives now to get some. And then the buying from a drug dealer or other strangers. I thought that was interesting because it starts out very low. Nobody wants to go, you know, find a drug dealer to get their meds. But as time was progressing and they weren't getting them from friends and family, 
that willingness to go to a drug dealer or some stranger and purchase these medications became a little bit higher on this scale. So the take home is um, friends and relatives uh, can start the damage rolling. Trends in opiate <coughs> overdose, overdose deaths. Um, you can see here that it's just a gradually progressively increasing line. That one on the right um, is the drug overdoses involving opiates. You might wonder, well, what the heck are all these other drugs that are adding to that big line there on the left? And I looked that up from this study, and they were um, uh, cocaine, methamphetamine, um, ecstasy, some of the other drugs that can cause an overdose um, is added in that total drug line. Uh, but the opiates are interesting in that all of those started going up except, um, it looks like the methadone use was decreasing from this article that I read. And the, the heroin, however, was increasing. There's some speculation that part of that could be caused by the fact that the ready availability of the prescription drugs was declining because regulations were becoming more, more strict as far as what, what pharmacies could dispense and what doctors could prescribe and all of the awareness and, and monitoring of the prescribers themselves um, was tending to make the amount of prescriptions go down a little bit and the thought was that heroin is cheaper and it's more potent and that may have contributed to the rise there in the heroin deaths. Uh, this is just a quick uh, thing I thought was interesting, motor vehicle accidents. We are getting safer with our motor vehicles. You can see that line going down and uh, quite a large increase just over these, these few years, especially 2012, 2014, we just are going up and up on this um, drug poisoning situation. Here's a little bit of a stratification in the age groups that we're seeing. So, um, you know, it's 25 to 34 is high, 45 to 54, I just read an article that was released um, just within the last few days from CDC. Again, the 45 to 54 year old group has gone up um, even higher than this. That is our highest um, overdose um, death rate is in that age group. Far more males than females we see dying from opioid overdoses. Uh, this was interesting, it's the non-Hispanic white um, group of people are, have a higher rate than the non-Hispanic black or the Hispanics. This was, you know, the slide that had the American Indian and Alaskan Native, I thought was pretty astounding, but we'll see in another slide. One of the big risk factors for all of this is um, a rural, um, rural population and uh, we'll go into a little bit of why that might be but I'm thinking maybe that has something to do with this because you don't typically see um, you know this is a fairly rural group that, you know Alaska is very spread out not dense populations and the American Indian population isn't hugely dense either this is just um, showing the prescription opioids, the adjusted rate of deaths um, in the prescription drugs and heroin both going up. You can see heroin kind of really climbing there, whereas prescriptions sort of are on a, a more slow climb. Um, this is just another one over a longer period of time showing that males are, are um, more prevalent in the overdose deaths than females. Heroin, again, um, in males, you see a much sharper increase in that use over the past um, you know, four years in this slide. So, um, save a life. This is something that has been um, being advocated 
And actually in California, they have recently passed legislation that allows pharmacists to actually prescribe and dispense naloxone, which is the reversal drug for opiate overdose. Um, that is, the goal is to try to get this antidote into the hands of the at-risk population. And some of those people may well not go and seek medical care um, and, and not have the money necessarily to pay for that. Uh, just don't, you know, oftentimes they're not seeking medical care for anything. But uh, it allows, without a prescription, the pharmacist is actually doing the prescribing. And so they have to have a training program. They have to train the patient in the use of the antidote. But it, the whole goal is to get more of that out there and try to save some lives. So what it does is it blocks the receptor site. Um, you can give it if a patient um, appears to have been, they're unconscious, you're not sure what caused it. You can give the drug and it's really not going to have, cause a problem if they're not under the influence of an opiate. So that, that's a good thing. Um, if they are taking opiates for pain and they've had an overdose situation, by blocking that, you are now bringing them back into perhaps a severe pain situation. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, but in any case, it is buying time. And the thing uh, that has to be on these prescriptions primarily is to call 911. This isn't bringing you back from an overdose and you go on and, you know, let's party some more. This is get some medical help. Because in many cases, the reversal agent doesn't last as long in your system as the drug itself that caused the overdose. So you really do need to get um, medical care on board. It's just a stopgap mechanism, this reversal. It brings you back um, and you need to, you know, pursue that medical assistance. It's available in injectable forms, in intranasal form, and it has, um, it even comes as an auto injector, much like the EpiPens, that are kind of a self-contained unit. I called all the pharmacies in town to kind of see what the situation is here. Um, the pharmacies are requiring a prescription. For the most part, they have not gone through the training and they don't, you know, it's fairly new that this is, is become available by this mechanism. They're going ahead and ordering the drug if you have a prescription. Um, the one that is doing the, uh, apparently they've had the training, um, Rite Aid will not require the physician's prescription. They don't carry the drugs. You have to order it through them. They can get it in and then they would do the training and the pharmacist can then write the prescription and keep those records. Um, there's training materials and all that come with it as well so that you can learn to use these things appropriately. Um, the ones that are in town, I think Tahoe Valley Pharmacy and the CDSs carry the nasal spray, um, but they are requiring the, um, a prescription from a doctor first. So it's just a matter of asking for that, really. I don't think that there's a physician here who would deny a patient this type of antidote um, prescription if he's prescribing um, you know, opiates for that patient. And the thing here is it's not just the patient who's taking these drugs that can qualify to get the naloxone. It's the parents, it's the you know, relative caregivers, it's the peers. You know, if you have a friend that you're really concerned about, you can get the naloxone prescription. There's a whole question, you know, array of questions to, to determine, um, you know, if it's a viable prescription for you to get. But certainly, if you have a child that you're concerned about, or friends, or whatnot, these are available. So that's that's really something new that has been um, on the market. And in Baltimore, I think I was reading their um, overdose rate has dropped substantially by getting this into the hands. We're already trying to get it into the hands of the first responders. So I believe the fire department has been, been getting this um, reversal agent, 
but it's available to um, you know to get to our, our police force, um, you know the paramedics that are going out, but you know getting into the hands of the people that are actually on on site when this overdose occurs is, is key. This is just something um, the website uh, the. The Board of Pharmacy has a website that has this in multiple languages, but it kind of goes through. There's one for the various types. This one happens to be showing for the injectable form. There's one that also shows how to use the nasal spray, too. And so this is just something that is available there and should be dispensed when the drug is actually dispensed. So I do want to talk a bit quickly about pain management because that kind of has a lot to do with how we've gotten into this mess. But pain management, there, there are two basic kinds. Your acute pain so is usually something that's kind of a sudden onset. Perhaps you had an injury. Um, you might have required surgery for something. It, it's an event that kind of has caused this pain. Could be mild to severe. Um, it's typically of shorter duration, and usually when the um, the incident is over, like your wound has healed, um, you know your bone has mended, whatever that is, the pain should resolve as well. So these are some of the examples of broken bones. And dental work, for instance, can be painful, but that pain goes away. Chronic pain is something that typically they'll put sort of a, a three-month marker on it. That something that's persisted beyond three months, despite the fact that the injury may have healed, um, but it can last for months, even years. Um, most notably, it would be cancer pain, would cause you know chronic pains. Something that's a nerve injury, perhaps. Arthritis is a disease that's ongoing, and so you may be experiencing pain that continues. Um, oops. But, um, you know, lower back pain is another one. But um, a lot of times the chronic pain, in fact, probably, I, I, I'd say in most cases, you've got an emotional component to that. And a lot of the time that component is anger. And, and what happens is the pain isn't going away. I don't know how many of you have experienced you know, pretty severe pain. You know, probably everyone at some point. But if you can imagine that being part of your life, that you are in pain continuously, it can be debilitating. And then the attitude of the public towards you when you are continuously getting your prescriptions for narcotics refilled and you don't seem to be getting better and then the, you know your friends and relatives are worried about you um, in terms of they're considering you to be an abuser now um, and you're mad at yourself and you're frustrated it's an ongoing very emotional experience and sometimes that even happens from inadequately treated acute pain we're now finding that Treating that acute pain adequately, getting the patients off of their medications quickly as things resolve can play a big part in not going down that path towards addiction. Great dilemmas for prescribers. It's been very difficult because you want to manage a patient's pain to their satisfaction so that they can be functional. And you want to avoid the development of abuse and potential addiction. And so it's kind of a two-way street for patients. It's kind of imperative that as patients, we are willing to accept some level of pain. It's not going to be zero, most likely. So you have some discomfort, and then you do some things to work toward regaining your function is, is important. Um, because trying to be pain-free probably isn't going to work for you. You're going to be happy to take more drugs in order to do that, and probably for a longer period of time, and you find you kind of like those drugs, uh, and now your, your situation has resolved, but your drug taking has not. And, you know, so it, it's really a balancing act for, for everyone involved. Risk factors any kind of history of substance abuse. And it can be genetic as well. So you want to include maybe family members
members who have a situation with addiction. And you want to let your prescriber know because they should be designing your pain therapy around the fact that you are an at-risk individual. So, you know, if you're trying to avoid abuse and addiction, you got to be up front with your caregiver and your prescriber. Um, multiple prescriptions for multiple providers, of course, that is going to um, be a big risk factor. High doses being required, using multiple drugs. One of the things that has really been coming out of late is the, the bad influence of benzodiazepines, so your Valium, your Xanax, your Ativan, taking that in conjunction with your opiates. It is causing more than simply an additive effect of that respiratory depression. A lot of the cases where you've seen an overdose, there's been benzodiazepines involved as well. So something to be aware of. I just got some, a notice in the mail. It was a big thing from Genentech because they are now the distributors. Of, I can't even remember which one, but it was a big warning now that if you are taking opiates, um, you should best not be taking this, but if you have to, be sure your prescriber knows about both so that they can maybe adjust your doses. Mental illness is a huge risk factor as well. Low income, low education, and then this rural residence, which they're thinking may have something to do with, um, you know, the type of work you have in more rural communities. Um, you know, you may maybe more blue collar workers, less professional people, hard working, maybe injured on the job type of situations so that they are prescribed pain medications. Um, also, it was interesting, the, one of the things that could be um, contributing to that is the outflux of the, the kids in your, um, in your society or the individuals who have more education or who have um, you know, better income levels, maybe leaving those rural areas and going to more urban areas. And so you're sort of self-determining that your rural space will have more at-risk individuals. I thought it was interesting. Um, some things that have happened, they do have prescription drug monitoring programs now where you can go online, the prescriber can go online, the pharmacist can go online. You can see how many prescriptions have been obtained and from how many physicians and how recently so you can get a pretty good idea of who is doctor shopping or, or pharmacy shopping and getting you know, increased amounts and doses of these drugs. Um, the CDC came out with huge guidelines for prescribing and they talk about the risk assessment that needs to be done by prescribers um, and more screening and then mandated prescriber education programs also. Multimodal approach to pain is pretty much start low, go slow. Start with non-pharmacological things. Now, certainly if you've just come out of surgery, we're not going to say put on a cold pack, you know, there'll be drugs involved. But, you know, typical injuries, you know, try some of these things first. Um, you know, we've got nice cold packs here now up in front. Um, massage therapy, aromatherapy. Um, you know, these things are kind of frowned upon by some, you know, thinking, oh, come on. But they really do work. There have been studies on most of these things to show that they really do have an impact on your pain management. Music. Um, I was at a concert. I could tell everybody was just enthralled at the concert. And I was thinking, hmm, I wonder how many pe these people have these pain situations, but I'll bet they're feeling better right now. And I think that's true. And then the pharmacological things, yes, opioids in some cases, but non-opioids that you can use that may be very effective. Acetaminophen, your Tylenol, your um, anti-inflammatories, uh, anti-convulsant drugs are sometimes prescribed, as well as antidepressants and muscle relaxers. So some of these other things, so that you don't need as high a dose of opiate um, as you would without some of these conjunctive therapies. Oh, did I forgot to mention compassion. All right, we're going to mention it again here. Because they have shown that with this emotion um, kind of connection to pain, 
that the influence on the patient's coping ability and their response is highly influenced by the feeling that their caregivers, friends, family are understanding them. They feel like people don't believe them, that they're kind of really frowned upon, they're sort of swept aside in the family, uh, that it's it's a difficult situation, especially with this long-term chronic pain patient. Um, you know, the compassion and understanding and, and trying to, you know, kind of work through this with them actually can lower that pain level, you know, as, as much as two or three points, which is big. Um, and it's great. So, okay, this is my preemptive strike slide because I figured this, this will come up as far as a question. What about marijuana? It has been shown to help alleviate pain in some individuals. Um, they've been able to extract certain components of the marijuana you know, entity. CBD is, is um, kind of described as one of those extractions. And um, so it's isolated from the, the part that causes the high. And some people that have had, you know, chronic pain experiences, um, you know, swear by the fact that this really does help. Now there are problems with that. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, you know, in, in children because there have been many studies that show that the that marijuana use in children. Now with the extract, it's something else. So it's, it's really kind of a fine line. Studies, you know, there are some studies, but we really need more studies to determine the exact dosing that needs to be um, used. Uh, there are potential side effects, long-term complications. We don't know about those yet because it's been fairly, free, you know, recently that this has been able to be extracted. So, well, there's, there's high hope for some of this in, in, in individuals. And some people say it really is almost the only thing that alleviates some of that pain. Um, you know, so there's a place for it, and there's more medical research going on with that. Um, you know, right now the, drug, the pharmaceutical companies don't have a piece of this action, and so the funding for <coughs> some of these studies aren't necessarily what they might be if you know they thought that they might have a hand in, in profiting from this. But to you know, study the isolated components specifically. Um, you know, you can get some standardized dosing, perhaps. Right now, um, federal law still says that it's illegal, and so you know, we don't really know what the repercussions of that is going to be. What can we do as a community to kind of <coughs> solve this opioid crisis? Just being aware of it and some of the contributing factors, I think, is important. Being honest with the prescribers as far as your addiction history and family addiction situations. Accepting that pain may not be eliminated, but it can hopefully be controlled to a tolerable level. Requesting smaller quantities of opiate medication. If you've got acute pain and, you know, Yes, you're going to have pain for probably a few days, you know, maybe a week or maybe even a little bit more, but you don't necessarily need a hundred tablets. And I've heard time and again that the amounts of uh, these medications that are prescribed are really way too high, I think, in terms of what that patient may really need. So then what do you become? You become a hoarder. You don't want to, you know, you just paid a bunch of money for this. And now you're one of the statistics of the friends and family that have drugs to share when the next family member runs into trouble with some pain situations. So, you know, asking, you can ask your prescriber, you know, I don't think I need a hundred of those. Why don't you start me with 30? If I need some more, we'll go through what it takes to get a refill, perhaps. So taking some responsibility is key, I think. Using some of the non-opioid methods of controlling the pain, not sharing, and disposing of medications properly, and um, Kelsey will talk to us a little bit about that. And then realizing that addiction is a disease and support recovery. And, you know, I'll tell you one thing, it is very difficult, um, get back to this, 
um, it, it's difficult to be compassionate. I know that it's a huge thing, but I have a brother who has struggled with, you know, drug abuse, and you just want to shake them. You know, it's it's such a sad situation, and you know, I mean, he was literally a rocket scientist, um, being called to do tests at jet propulsion labs in Southern California got into drug issues, and he's really been pretty much incapacitated for about 15 years. And I just, you know, I just want to shame and say, come back, come back. But, you know, it, it's a sad situation. But, um, you know, I think that, that trying to help him in any way and being compassionate, trying to be understanding, as hard as that may be, it's something that we need to do, I think, as a society. So with that, I will have um, Kelsey, do you want to come up and talk about the safe keeping of the drugs? And we will have some time for questions, but I want to get through all of that. Okay, um, so my name is Kelsey McGoon, and I am the coordinator for the South Tahoe Drug Free Coalition. And I was asked to come and talk to you guys today about safe disposal and safe keeping of your medications. Um, so like you can say, um, it wouldn't become another statistic of getting that into the wrong hands, um, making sure that you're not that person that's starting somebody down that's the pretty slow of addiction. So first we're going to talk about safekeeping. Um, the first thing to do, what we recommend is to lock up your meds. Make sure that other people can't get into it, um, can't access it, it's not easily accessed by children especially. Um, we want to make sure that they're not getting accidental access to it, having to call poison control centers, um, so what we have at the Drug Free Coalition is we did fund a program where we offer free lock bags to the public. Um, so these come with a nice lock at the top, they're pretty sturdy, they're not terrible. Um, they do come with a prescription log inside, that way you can keep track of your medications, make sure you're counting them, that you have all of them, um, there's them missing. And also, what people have told me is like, well isn't this bag easy to steal? True, you can just take the bag, but it'd be more obvious versus having it in your medicine cabinet and not noticing that maybe one or two pills is missing. So it's much more evident that you have good medications this way. Um, there's also boxes and other items available online that you can use as well. Um, you wanna make sure that you are counting the number of prescriptions in your bottle. Um, make sure that you're taking, that's also for you, making sure that you're taking the correct amount you're not overdosing, like um, Terry was saying. Sometimes, if you have um, low dose or a low um, long-term pill, it can have a slow onset, and so you might be tempted to take more. But having that um, chart there can let you know whether you're taking too many. So, also want to make sure that you're keeping track of your medication's expiration date. Um, if they start to crumble, if they get powdery, those are things to look for. Um, you don't want to be taking medications that have expired because they act differently in your body. Also want to make sure that you are keeping them in a cool and dry place. And that sometimes a lot of people will keep them in their bathroom cabinets. Um, and that's usually not the best place. It's very humid in there. Um, you can get kind of wet. So unless you have good ventilation in there, probably not the best place to keep your pills. Um, and top of that, you're going to go on to disposal. So number one thing, um, what a lot of people were told in the past was hang on to your medications. You don't know when you need them. So people kind of had this idea of storing medications for a long time and importing them. So the new thing um, that doctors should be recommending and that we do encourage is to make sure that you're disposing of your medications properly. That means anytime that they're expired, unwanted, or unused, um, to dispose of them correctly. So what the Drug Free Coalition, what we um, suggest is to not flush your medications down the drain. Um, those medications end up in the water system, they can affect fish, which can also get, affect humans. Um, a lot of water treatment plants aren't equipped to take those out of the water, so um, it gets run off. So that's something that ends up in our beautiful Lake Tahoe. We don't want it to be filled with a lot of hormones, a lot of um, additives and prescription drugs as well. So what you can do if you want to properly dispose of it at home, um, there are a couple different ways to do it. What we suggest is um, to mix the medicines, that way people can't go through and pick out the ones that they want. Um, preferably don't crush them or the capsules, um, just keep them whole, but just mix them up. Um, put them in an unsalatable 
sub unpalatable substance, um, such as dirt, kitty litter, used coffee grounds. Um, that way, it discourages people from going through it, um, children, and then animals as well. So if you're throwing it in the trash, you don't want animals to get into it and end up overdosing through that way as well. So what we um, suggest when you're throwing it out, that it's better that, um, I've talked to a couple different people about this one, um, when you send it to the waste treatment plant, the way that they're composting it, um, they have a liner that makes it so it's not going directly into the earth, um, but there is still some runoff indeed. Um, it is still an issue and there's no particularly safe way to do it, even if you are, um, say, uh, burning it, um, which a lot of police departments will do, there is still that residue in the air as well. So we're still working on the exact way to make sure that there's no runoff as um, much as possible. But um, this way, what we also have is um, there are chemicals um, that you can put in. This is one called Intera, and this is something that you can put mixed up with the prescription drugs, and it deactivates it. So that makes it so it's a little bit less harmful if it does get into the environment. So this is something that you can just put in there, mix it with water, and then you can throw it away like that. Um, so these are available online, and we're also the coalition is looking into trying to get these um, as well as free as well. Um, also, when you are throwing away any kind of prescription medication, usually if you look at the bottle, um, a lot of your personal information is on there. So you want to make sure that you're scratching it out or covering it with a marker um, so nobody can get access to it, refill your prescription without your knowledge or anything like that, or have any kind of um, your personal information with that. Um, yeah, so um, the first, um, South Chapel Drug Free Coalition that had a part in installing a permanent take-back bin in the police department. So there is a year-round um, prescription drug take-back bin, which is in the police department lobby. Um, it's over in the corner, it's kind of discreet, so it's not like you'll have a bunch of people looking over at you as you're throwing away your medication. Um, it's anonymous, you don't have to tell anybody what you're putting in there, but um, we do suggest no needles or sharps or liquids. Um, and then also, um, there are usually about twice a year drug take-back days that the um, Drug Free Coalition and the Police Department work together for those ones. And so that's another opportunity to go out, meet your local law enforcement, um, be friends with them, and you can dispose of your medication there as well. So. <laughs>